Okay, protein subfamily analysis, and I will, we're going to talk about finding functional sites from protein multiple alignments. And you've done a little bit of this before, um, which is you take a multiple sequence alignment, we calculate conservation on the columns. I'm going to explain a bit more about that and what that means. Um, you can look at this histogram underneath and see conserved physical positions that have conserved physicochemical properties. And that might tell you something about how important those positions are. So you might expect with an enzyme family that the active site residues would all be identical across the family. You might expect uh, positions that are important for stabilizing the core of the protein to be highly conserved hydrophobics or something similar. Okay, so that, um, that idea of conservation comes from this diagram, which I showed, I think, in the first lecture. Um, one, there's this program called AMAS that we, my group developed in the early uh, 90s, but is now is, is, is what's built into JALView, which does the coloring, the conservation coloring. Um, <clears throat> what, you, what it effectively does is it, divide, it, it, it says, um, if, I give it a, if I have a set of amino acids at a column, thanks Alexi, if I have a set of amino, different amino acids in a position in a column, um, how many set boundaries do I have to cross to group them all together? It's kind of basically, conceptually what it does. So if you have to cross a lot of set boundaries, then that's low, low conservation. If you have to, don't have to cross very many, then it means it's highly conserved. Essentially, there's a bit of maths to kind of make it normalized. There are a whole bunch of different methods for calculating conservation at a position in an alignment. And this guy, William Valdar, wrote a really nice review back in 2002, which had all of them described and how they compared and their strengths and weaknesses. And we've implemented all of them in JALView. So there's, they're all accessible from within JALView under the web services menu. OK, I'm not going to show you those, but they're, they're all there. If you, if you have a particular conservation scheme you really love, somebody told you it was the best thing, then you can probably find it in JALview. Um, so as I said, you can eyeball the alignment, you can look at conserved columns and say color-coded color and see interesting features, perhaps. But what I want to talk about is subfamily analysis, because I think this is very powerful. Um, it's not, we did a little bit of this with the immunoglobulins, but I'm going to show you where it all came from and why we, why we did it, and how, um, how you can make useful predictions about functional residues using this kind of approach. So subfamily analysis, I call it a mass analysis. It's analysis of multiple aligned sequences. There are related methods called tree determinant positions. So the idea there is if you take a multiple alignment and you calculate a tree from it, an evolutionary tree, there are certain positions that are more informative than others in the alignment that capture more of the information, the variability across the sequences. And those positions are the ones that are going to tell you the differences and similarities between the sequences. Um, and there's this method called evolutionary trace, uh, developed by, not by us, but by Oliver Lichtlage, um, which does, exploit, uh, does this kind of thing. So I'm going to take you through an example. This is a subfamily analysis of the annexins. Does anyone know anything about annexins? Somebody's nodding, oh dear. Somebody knows about annexins, so you're going to have to, I don't know very much about annexins. Um, but there's a lot of, a lot of sequences uh, in 1990. So back in 1990, I was talking to a guy called Mike Crumpton, Crumpton and Paul Freeman, who were working on this family, and they didn't know the structure, didn't know much about them. They knew they bound calcium, and we were just trying to understand the system better. So we had a bunch of sequences. Uh, they have multiple domains. They didn't know the tertiary structure, and so we tried to do some analysis, and it ended up being a paper. It took about a yeah, while to get it published, but it was published in 91. So about the annexins, we knew there were calcium and phospholipid binding. There were 22 known sequences. <laughs> uh, they ranged from insect to human. They were found in many cell types and implicated in all these different processes. And when you looked at a single annexin uh, sequence, they had this kind of basic structure. They had a variable N-terminal domain and then four uh, repeats. So this is similar to this, is similar to this, is similar to this. Um, some annexins, annexin 6, had 8 repeats, and in fact, after we did this work, there were some with 16 repeats, and possibly, I don't know, you'd probably tell me, maybe there's ones with 32, I don't know. I've not worked on this in like 25 years. So. so one of the things you can do is take a protein sequence and compare it to itself if you're looking for repeats. 
And this is a dot plot comparison of uh, an X in one compared to itself. So you basically put a sequence down this axis, the same sequence along here, and wherever the amino acids are identical or similar according to their physicochemical properties, you put a dot. And what that helps you to find is that across, across the major diagonal, of course, they're identical because it's the same full length sequence. But when you have repeats, you see lines running parallel to the main diagonal. And this shows you that this region of the sequence here is actually similar to the beginning of the sequence. And it's also similar to this part and maybe also to this part down here. And that shows you there's really four repeats and you see the four repeats down here. And you can start to see things like this repeat, the third one is maybe a bit weaker similarity to the others than the others are to each other. So you can start to see things in a dot plot, but that's a rather, it's a rather visual way of looking at it. It gives you an idea, but it's a bit hard to do much with it beyond say, oh yeah, I've got some repeats. So you can say, maybe help use this to help identify where the repeat boundaries are, which is what we did. And then you compare those repeats to each other pairwise and calculate a tree. So I talked about pairwise sequence comparison last week. You compare them all pairs, you calculate this SD score, this Z score I talked about last week, and you can plot a tree based on that. That's a bit confusing. As I say, there's a lot of sequences here. Okay, there's maybe some structure in this tree, but it's hard to see, but I can highlight it for you. Uh, there are actually four groups here um, that are very clearly delineated. Um, and these correspond either to domains one and five, uh, two and six, four and eight, or three and seven. And what that shows is that actually um, um, domain one is really, if you have an eight repeat, domain one is sim more similar to domain five in the eight than it is to the others. And so it shows that there's a gene duplication, essentially, that's happened of four repeats. So the basic unit is four and it's been duplicated. So these kinds of things you can start to see by doing what is very basic sequence analysis and calculating a tree. So based on that tree, you can build a multiple sequence alignment. Um, this was, I say, 1990. We didn't have Jalview. We didn't have Alscript. We didn't have anything to present the alignment. Um, we were slightly, we had moved on slightly from using pieces of paper and writing it out in squared paper, like I said in my first lecture, I think. But this was, this was a multiple alignment representation where the sequences are running down the page now rather than across. And this is repeat one, two, three, and four. And each of the repeat sequences is shown down. And there's some advantages in showing it this way around because it makes it easy, just easier to scan the patterns across. So we're used to looking, you know, well, if, you, if you write in most languages, English-like English languages, um, you kind of read left to right or right to left. And we're used to scanning. And it's a little easier, I find, to look across uh, alignment like this to see patterns rather than looking down, although you can do both, you know, it's just... Um, so this, this, this shows, um, by, by looking at this alignment, um, you can see features, the predicted secondary structure, predicted alpha helices, in this case, it's all helical protein prediction, found conserved positions across the whole family of sequences, but what you could also start to do was look and say, well, are there any positions that are, say, conserved in one repeat um, um, and conserved in another repeat, but maybe it's a different type of amino acid? Or is there anything special about one of the repeats compared to others at a position level? Because we know these are different to each other. They cluster separately on the tree, but which positions make it cluster in that way? Which are the positions in the alignment? Because those positions are likely to be functionally or structurally important in some way. They're going to be conferring something about what that individual domain does that's special compared to what the other domains do. So for example, you, one of the things you could look at is charge comparison. So this is a blow up of part, part of that to show that it, now looking, now the repeats are running across, just to confuse you, the sequences are running across, we've now rotated. Well this came, this, this plot came later than that previous one. You can tell from the the style of this, it's a blue, one of these old fashioned diazo slides as well, it's a very old plot. Um, but um, a bit later we developed some software that made it easier to do this and that's what you're seeing here. It's called a mass and it, the sequences run across the screen now. 
and just zooming in on one part, looking at comparisons of charge. So here you see that in, in this set of sequences, there's a glutamic acid, which is absolutely conserved. And in the same position, there's an absolutely conserved arginine, exactly the same position in the alignment in two different repeats. So this, these are, this is one, one set of repeats, and this is the other, and it's completely conserved. So these are you know, basically a negatively charged and positively charged amino acid. So that's kind of interesting. And what that suggests, we kind of thought this protein with four repeats folded up into a single globular unit. There was not four things on a chain, it formed a single globular unit. So the hypothesis was perhaps these two formed a salt bridge. They're clearly important in some way to those domains. It's clearly important that it's always a glutamate and always an arginine. But, you know, maybe it forms a salt bridge. So it made various predictions, predicted there were five helices, predicted which residues were in the core from the hydrophobic patterns, and this pair, this pair here, um, you know, there's a conserved glutamic acid in repeats two and an arginine in repeats four, and that suggested that it formed a salt bridge. Um, uh, there were various other things. There was a there was a paper that had suggested it was like euterglobin, and we we kind of scotched that. We didn't think that was the case. Anyway, a little bit later, a group uh, solved the th first crystal structure of this family of proteins, and it looked like this, and pretty much we got it right in terms of the secondary structure, the five helices, and that salt bridge is right in the middle. It ties the whole thing together. So it's, a, you know, it's clearly a function important, it's structurally important feature. So the reason I show you this is we found all this just by looking at the sequences and thinking about what the sequence conservation patterns might mean in terms of 3D structure and doing a bit of structure prediction. So this kind of thing can be very, this kind of approach can be very powerful at understanding functionally important sites. So this, you know, looking at subgroup comparison can really highlight those functionally important residues. So given the experience with that, we decided to generalize the principle and I had a PhD student at the time, great Craig Livingstone, who got the job of doing this. And he developed this thing called a mass for doing this. And the idea was to uh, generalize this idea of, uh, this is the tree I showed you before, but you have this kind of principle that you've got, um, you calculate a tree, you then within each part, this is the small fragment of multiple sequence alignment. And what you're doing is you're saying for every position here, what is happening? If I take, if I take this, group of residues and I add it to this group, what happens? Does the conservation score for that group stay the same or does it go down? Or do I have perhaps to a position like here where it's highly conserved in this set, it's highly conserved in this set, but they're different properties, I mean, different properties. So in the much the same way as the previous example, we had a glutamic acid and an arginine, both highly conserved, but different properties. One's positive, one's negative. Can we do this in a general purpose way? And that's, that's essentially what this program does, a mass. You can still use this through the web um, to do this kind of pairwise analysis and it produces output a bit, looks a bit like this. Um, and this is essentially what goes on in Jalview when you do a conservation and calculation. When you subgroup, which we've done a few times now, and you're gonna do in a minute, you're gonna, you're gonna reproduce this paper in a minute in Jalview in a few minutes. It took me like days to go through this by hand, um, just to illustrate that you can do it. Okay, so what you do, well, the principles are, what happens to conservation when you put two subfamilies together? Does it stay high? That implies the position is important to both and doing a similar job. So it's hydrophobic in both and it's staying conserved. Does it go from high to low? That could be it's important to both, but the position um, is important for novel features. So if it's conserved, High, highly conserved in both subgroups, but you put the two subgroups together, conservation goes down. That means it's important to either group, but it's obviously something about specificity. It's, you know, it could mean affect the binding, or it could affect some other properties of those two subgroups of sequences. So in this, in this example, we were dealing with repeats within the same protein, but of course you can do exactly the same thing with sequences across a family, a wider family of proteins and try to and use this approach to try and spot the most informative, useful, interesting positions. So there are a number of references which are in here for different things. So this is, um, this is our work from back from 1993. 
Um, and there's a review paper in Methods and Entomology in 96 about this that gave a bit more detail. And a summary of the first paper. Both of these you can download from my website as PDFs. Just don't tell the publishers. Um, and yeah, okay. Uh, the other things, okay, tree determinant positions. So as I've said already, these are positions in the alignment that are most responsible for the topology of the tree you calculate from the sequence alignment. And they may be functionally important. There's a kind of similar interpretation on what, what I've just told you. This is an example of some work, um, again, done in my group by, um, um, in this case, Jonathan Manning, who, who was in Dundee. And the idea is you take the multiple alignment, you calculate all pairs of similarities between, or distances between all the sequences, and you calculate that matrix of numbers, and then you um, save that, and then you take, do the same thing for a window, a local window, and you calculate another, and you compare that to this big one. And the idea is, if this is similar to this, then it's, um, it's probably one, the, the, this region is probably something to do with what defines the tree, um, because it's similar to the global matrix, whereas if it's different, then it's, it's less likely to be important uh, for defining the differences between the tree. So you can do that, you calculate correlation coefficient, basically wander along, and you end up with a plot like this with some peaks, which are the positions that are most likely to be um, de determining the, um, uh, you know, the most likely to be the, the important functionally, important sites in the protein family. Um, and I think I've got a picture of this, this is for globins. So this is a prediction of sites that are likely to be important um, for binding, uh, for, for, for um, uh, packing in the core of the protein. And by eye, you can obviously see that they're almost identical to the actual sites that might, <laughs> no, sorry. Anyway, this is a rather anecdotal example, but just to show the kinds of things you can do. You can make predictions about sites that are important in some way to the protein from looking at sequences. Okay, there's a few other, a few, quite a few groups have done work in this area. Um, Alfonso Valencia's group have done quite a lot of work on this. Um, they have methods based on that. Um, Oliver Lichtarj, I mentioned earlier, he has this approach called tree determinants. Again, um, these approaches are all you know, similar in a way in what they try to do. 